Hello, and welcome to episode 7 of Memento Mori. Today I will discuss a concept I have come to call forced competition, which is my description of socio-economic interactions between people in relatively sustainable economies. In general, social sciences of neoliberal education, the prevailing trend in capitalist democracies, favor a depiction of human nature that is rooted in self-interest and a description of the human species as a self-gratifying machine set out to consume and deplete resources regardless of the expenses. Realist theorists suggest this all occurs within the larger context of competition over resources, and this pits social groups or tribes in open conflict in less sustainable regions. These concepts are rooted in socio-economic theory termed rational choice and a related concept known as the zero-sum game and even international relations theories that depart from realism, such as liberalism, iterate a zero-sum competition where nation-states are at odds over scarce resources and thus competition over those resources is the only route towards progression. In addition to rational choice theory and zero-sum game theory is a concept known as the tragedy of the commons. This term was coined by William Foster Lloyd. In summary, Lloyd described the tragedy of commons as a model for limited resources divvied between cattle herders. Each herder had a plot of land for their cattle to graze. Since herders had a limited plot for grazing, there was always a risk of overgrazing. If one of the herders is irresponsible, he will allow overgrazing to deplete the pasture to the detriment of everyone. Lloyd was a contemporary of Thomas Malthus. Malthus is notorious for his theory that overpopulation leads to resource depletion, thus depopulation. He asserts this was a natural phenomenon that occurs in cycles unless it is mitigated. It makes perfect sense that Lloyd would echo Malthus's assertion regarding resource scarcity, and these concepts are taken as a priori truths, unquestioned and unchallenged, in macroeconomics courses. Theorist Garrett Hardin fused Lloyd's and Malthus's concept in his article titled The Tragedy of the Commons to the journal Science. Hardin suggested a solution to the overpopulation dilemma by using Lloyd's theory to basically state that overpopulation is self-regulated due to the inherent deterrence observed when a family grows so large that it is incapable of feeding and rearing each child. Hardin's article pioneered the use of the term commons to mean the shared space and its resources amid human populations. These are the theories at the heart of our current status quo, economically and politically. For every political philosophy begins with the theorist's description of human nature, and for realists, liberals, and neoliberals alike, the human condition is one of bitter competition over resources. These theories include the so-called Democrat and Republican parties of the United States and a multitude of adjacent parties around the world. What's more, these theories have bolstered other economic theories such as laissez-faire economics and the so-called Austrian school. Laissez-faire is a French term that means to let something be. In this case, it is an assertion that market enterprises should be allowed to do as they like without government oversight. And this concept coupled with the Austrian school of thought results in the idea that competition in the market drives enterprises to strive and innovate towards progress. This is somehow supposed to solve the problem of resource scarcity as it would ideally result in in firms developing the skills to maximize the utility of resources. But these assertions are every bit as utopian and baseless as the most idealized form of communist theory. In their model, laissez-faire economists assume innovation and maximization of utility is always the outcome in such a situation. But this is not the case. Rather, we have seen the growth of mega-monopolies and zombie firms deplete middle-class incomes and stagnate both production and infrastructure around the globe, which is the real outcome of this model. Of course, I will not deny the fact that we do have scarce resources, and we do have overpopulation in particular locations, but to focus just on those two dynamics will only result in self-fulfilled prophesying, which is the habit of inevitably making our worries come true by fretting about them and closing our minds to other possibilities. The truth about our planet is that it does indeed have limited resources, and humans can indeed fall into the habit of depending 
depleting those resources by acting out of ignorance, that is, not having an accurate inventory of goods, greed, that is, selfishly consuming everything with no regard for others, and aversion, which is consuming resources or hoarding them out of spite of others. These challenges will always be a part of the human condition, but they are not indicative of our nature wholesale, as these theorists basically rode the coattails of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, they only focused on particular aspects of human nature. And as competition over limited resources has unfortunately been one particular habit of humans in dire straits, we have other examples to the contrary. There are tales of human betrayal and hoarding or depleting of resources, as well as rationing and distributing resources. For every bombed supply line, there are airdrops of care packages, and the motivations behind either are very difficult to explain. These traits were the focus of Peter Kropotkin's book, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution, where he explained we humans have evolutionary traits for survival that reward collaboration over competition. In essence, we benefit more when we collaborate than we do when we dominate. Conflict between humans is always damaging to the overall system of resource utilization. When cooperation between members of a group bolsters the survival of the individual, it becomes a method of survival vis-a-vis -vis natural selection. Thus, social skills and group survival is perhaps more conducive for the individual than going it alone. Kropotkin highlighted the benefit to altruism and mutualism among species, and how concepts like kin selection, that is, the habit of protecting offspring even at one's own detriment, and reciprocal altruism, which is the behavior of giving up one's own nutrition or fitness for the sake of others, mitigate concerns about depletion and hoarding. If we just sit and think about this for a moment, thoughts of parents feeding their children before they eat and of adult offspring caring for their elder parents should come to mind. And these are the traits we enact when we protest the injustice of firms who prop up apparatuses of competition over the wellness of their employees. And furthermore, the nation state that allows and advocates for this type of system is just as biased as rational choice and laissez-faire theorists. One could say they are one in the same. The competition in the market led by firms today is a bottleneck that only serves the interest of executives and their so-called private agenda. And the people who are unable to fit through the bottleneck are left to spill out into dire straits, constantly transient in search of job opportunities, barely able to survive. Meanwhile, political agents exacerbate the severity of this forced competition through austerity policies on one end and dependency policies on the other. And the military-industrial complex exploits these conditions as well. With every impoverished youth conditioned by confusion and violence in their neighborhoods comes a standard-issue uniform waiting for them in a supply garage somewhere. Sometimes time between the 1930s and 1950s, German psychoanalyst Karen Horney observed an aberrant trait among individuals. This trait was an obsessive need to compete and dominate others. She called this hyper-competitiveness. Later theorists cited her as being ahead of her time and came to the realization that this phenomenon explains behavior in the U.S. and economies informed by the capitalist model. Horney said that this aberrant disposition causes the sufferer to move against others as opposed to move moving towards or away from others. And this trait is most drastic when it is experienced by individuals in positions of leadership, commanding vast swaths of resources and so-called human capital. Elitists, who are the biggest influences in human affairs, are socialized to fixate on competition. And this ripples down to the individuals in the rest of society, to the detriment of the vulnerable. The true condition of resources is a logistical disaster. The potential to harness goods and energy in abundance is just around the corner. But the conditions put forth by our current economic status quo prevent us from leaping from the stagnant market system to a resource-based economy. In this current status quo, those of us who don't have access to people in power are left to fend in a situation of forced competition where we are never promised the dignity of a day's meal. Presently, we are the most economically precarious we have ever been since the Great Depression, and there is no indication this will change. I think this is the situation now because both 
ordinary people who lack access and elites who sequester themselves from the lives of commoners have what the Buddha called conceits about their position and the other's position. A conceit is when we believe there is a fundamental difference or sameness between us and another person. In Buddhism, a conceit that one is better than another, one is the same as another, and one is lesser than another are all delusions. In the case of juxtaposing elites with power to, let's say, common people with diffused or no power, there is a relationship between the two concerning how one thinks of the other. An elite may have the conceit that they are better than common people, but this is troubled by the fact that they are mortal, and one mere thought experiment can illustrate this rather well. We place a handful of so-called elites on a stranded island with so-called common people, removing them from their status and access to resources. Their status is suddenly taken away from them. There is no guarantee that even their leadership skills will place them back in leadership of common people. The dynamic changes entirely where even a janitor could rise to leadership, and why not? This shines a light on privilege and vulnerability via the accident of birth. In turn, common people might feel lesser than elites, but this is also a delusion. As with the janitor leading the group on the desert island, common people are just as capable of proving their worth among the group, but we must also be careful of not falling into the conceit of sameness. This is the concept that mistaking other people as being of the same temperament will react the same to stimuli and have the same proclivities as ourselves is misplaced. Basically, if we hold the expectation that someone will agree with us, we will invariably wind up disappointed. It is misplaced to think that other people have the same temperament, will react the same to stimuli, and have the same proclivities as ourselves. Basically, if we hold the expectation that someone will agree with us, we will inevitably wind up disappointed. With all this in mind, we can see that the competition among firms in modern economies is constructed through economic theories acted out socially and politically. Thus, forced competition is the observation that, despite our potential for a more equitable and sustainable resource economy, enterprises and their purchased politicians pitch competition as a motivational factor for the labor force to produce favorable outcomes. But when these concepts cause the majority of people anxiety and depression, and we become economically precarious, the phenomenon of forced competition is no longer a viable economic model. So long as elites think of the labor force as human capital and just another pool of resources to choose from, they will invariably pit us against one another. A real world example is my situation now. I am a teacher who works a yearly contract. In this case, there is no way to achieve collective bargaining in a way that syndicated unions do. So since I lack representation and collective support from people in the same vocation, I am subject to being replaced when my contract finishes. This is a problem for job security and income, and one might think, just work somewhere else. But that is easier said than done, when time is limited and employment options become scarce. The job market changes rapidly often, and vocational training or retraining is so time-consuming that by the time large portions of the labor force are ready for work, a whole new bottleneck is formed. And since elites maintain confidential access to labor projections in their firms, the labor force always lags behind. This is why people are pitted in this competition and that's why I qualify it as forced competition. When we take competition too seriously, like when we think of it as a driver for socioeconomic behavior, it invariably becomes a source of conflict. It pushes all the wrong buttons, irritability, jealousy, hostility, and cunning. These qualities are pretty much considered positive attitudes to certain people in the workforce because they have become accustomed to working in a highly competitive environment. But this condition is plain ridiculous. When all of the things we need are organizationally feasible, we just need to reconfigure our global economy to focus on resource allocation over depletion and hoarding. For what is the point to making life an exercise in stress and resentment when we all ultimately die anyways? Well, thank you for listening. If you get something out of this, please support my channel by simply feeding the YouTube algorithm. In the next episode, I will discuss the war in Ukraine, my activism in Japan, and how we can help. Until next time, thank you. And I wish you experience compassion, kindness, and joy.